at American Political Radio would like to take a moment to reach out to a portion of our listening audience. To the mainstream media, liberals masquerading as conservatives who'd like to see us off the air, snowflakes from sea to shining sea, the self-righteously indignant, you know who you are, and 7th century barbarians everywhere, to those spinning their wheels trying to take us down, we have a special message just for you. At APR, we're happy to be your 24-7, 365 obsession. And while you have your little panties in a wad because we're not politically correct, we're telling real conservatives what you don't want them to hear. The truth. And we're not going to stop. Now then, back under your collective bridges with the rest of your fellow trolls and, oh yeah, thanks for listening to Right Side Patriots on American Political Radio. Welcome to Right Side Patriots on APR, American Political Radio, Craig Andreessen from the National Patriot, Diane Sori from the Patriot Factor, welcoming you on a Tuesday evening edition of Right Side Patriots. And Diane, we're going to start the show with a very special guest. Yes, we are. Our friend Muda Zahran, the Secretary General of the Jordanian Opposition Coalition. Mudar, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You know, we were kind of worried about you. You were not feeling so well a, a few days ago, a week ago or so, when, when last we chatted online, and you're feeling better now? Well, absolutely much better. Thank you very much. You know, well, London could be could be a very cold place. <laughs> well, yeah. we were concerned. We were we were a little concerned, and uh, it's it's good to hear your voice sounding, you know, so much better and so strong. But Mudar, you've got a very special event coming up, uh, a conference, and what we want to do today is let our listeners know through you what's going on, where it's going on, when it's going on, and what you hope to get out of it. Well, the upcoming conference in Jerusalem is titled the Jordan Option Conference. Some dub it the Jordan is Palestine Conference. It's on the 17th of October. It's organized by Ezra Pandit and its chairman, Ted Bellman, uh, a Canadian-Israeli lawyer, and uh, also the International Jewish Muslim Dialogue Center, which is led by Executive Director Michael Ross, a Republican Trump supporter and a, an American lobbyist and lawyer. The conference is very relevant to American politics in the sense that it's trying to bring a feasible end to the Israeli-Palestinian or Arab conflict. How is this very relevant to America? It's very relevant in the sense that the Israeli-Arab conflict, by all standards, have been very instrumental to the globalists. Let's not get into, you know, the Alex Jones theories of conspiracy, whether they are <laughs> right or wrong. But bottom line is, the, that conflict, if you watch television, you would think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the biggest conflict in the world. The number of casualties on both sides is very dramatically painful, but yet very statistically minimal. One or two people each and every week. That I wouldn't call that a conflict. You know, people dying of car accidents in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Israel are you know, much higher than that, and it's not in the news. Nonetheless, the media keeps you know, hammering this and always reporting on it and making it the biggest conflict in the world. There is a good reason for that. Reason is some entities and governments and systems and regimes in the Arab world and in the West and the globalists have used that conflict to A, pass agendas they want in the Middle East, B, which is unfair to the locals and the native of the Middle East, be it them Jews, Muslims or non-Muslims, it, they also have used the same uh, conflict to deter the attention of the world. For example, Clinton, whenever he got caught up in, in a scandal, suddenly he launched the peace process, and he started talking about the peace process. Hmm. Same thing was with uh, Obama. Same thing was with uh, Mr. George W. Bush when 
things went very bad and awful in Iraq, suddenly he began, uh, you know, pushing the peace process uh, nonsense. Unfortunately, this is very unfair to Israelis and the Palestinian Arabs and to the Americans. This conflict has cost the American taxpayers a total, a total, in the last 20 years alone, a total of $100 billion. Wow. In all aspects, aid, money, uh, aid that goes, Jordan alone received, uh, the King of Jordan received $20 billion in the name of the conf conflict only in the last 17 years. That's a huge amount of money paid by American taxpayers to a silly conflict that could always be resolved easily. In short, for those who don't know the history, there was a country called Palestine. It has a, had the Jewish minority and a Muslim majority. There has been there was a war between both of them. The Jews gained their independence, and the Arabs and the Muslims gained their independence in a country called Jordan. Today, the Arabs, for the last 75 years, almost almost 70 years, they've been pushing for Israel to give up more land of the 22 percent of the land that they had. It's been dysfunctional, and it was the uh, designed in that way to to prolong and last for as long as possible. And now we're bringing it to an end. I think we have a good reason to believe it's going to happen because we have a man in the White House who also, I believe, sees it as unnecessary and silly because mm -hmm. he's a businessman. He does he does the math. He does the uh, checks and balances, and he sees a terrorist. Uh, uncalled for corrupt leadership uh, controlling the West Bank, and he sees another corrupt terror supporting king in Jordan, and obviously he doesn't see any point, I believe, in supporting uh, those two. This conference is what what will make it happen. Uh, we are, as Jordan's opposition coalition, we are legitimate, we are popular, we are established. And all we need is just the world tolerance and a listening ear. And this is what we are planning to do through this conference. Interesting. Interesting. Do you think, by any chance, you can actually bring peace to the Middle East? Can you get the Palestinian people to understand that Jordan is actually their homeland and can you influence the people of Jordan itself to understand that King Abdullah is not their friend? Well, the people of Jordan have had enough of him already. They've been protesting against him for the last seven years, and the media is not, for some strange reason, is not reporting it at all. They've been uh, rallying against him, calling him names. A quick look on social media shows how the amount of discontent in the king himself. On the other hand, people of the West Bank, under the so-called Palestinian Authority's control, they've had enough, and a recent poll showed that 70% uh, of them, in Jerusalem at least, would rather be under Israeli control, which is common sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, a lot of people, for example, in um, Puerto Rico would rather be under American influence or American system over than, for example, being under Cuban system. It's just common sense. Well, I mean, yes, let's, let's, let's take a look at that, because this is a very interesting aspect, and we've talked about this before on the show with you, but the, the reason that so many of the Arabs that are living uh, in, these, in these regions, in these, these territories, would rather be under Israeli control is for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's, there's safety, there's you know, the defense, but you know, certainly the economic situation would be much better for them under is under the Israelis than it is as things stand today. Correct. Also, the human rights. The Israelis hmm. uh, identify themselves in the West Bank as a almost sometimes they identify themselves as uh, an occupation force, not necessarily an occupation force, as they call it the territories. They don't. They wouldn't say, "Well, this is ours." And they wouldn't say it's not ours. But at the same time, and I've lived in the West Bank, and I'm often visiting the West Bank, no Israeli soldier could, would, or could beat you up for no reason. No Israeli soldier would actually beat you up or use excessive force. In fact, they are very restrained in their use of force. 
No Israeli soldier would, uh, or a police officer would torture you. No Israeli politician would ask for bribes and, and or extort you. The Palestinian Authority has been a disaster. As far as your American listeners are concerned, the Palestinian Authority did cost them, has cost them over $30 billion since its inception for no good reason. They finance terrorists. If you kill a Jew, um, you go to jail for five, six life sentences. If you blow up a bus or blow up a restaurant or pizzeria, they give you a stipend in, the, in excess of $3,000. While a college professor, a Western-educated, American-educated college professor gets barely $1,200. This is a waste. This is a shame. And this has to end. People in Jordan uh, and in the West Bank have had enough of the people ruling them. And they're willing to accept change and move forward. Uh, also, this is a fact that in the Middle East, it's all about the will of the leaders. Yes, people have a choice. We want to stand up for them and for the rights. But everything revolves around the leader, what the leader wants and what the leader doesn't want. Sadat was a very pragmatic guy. Sadat of uh, Egypt, the late Sadat, was very pragmatic. So he established peace with Israel. Um, the people that came after him, like Mubarak, Mubarak was very, you know, he established what we call a cold peace with Israel. Um, one Jordanian expert, his name is Samer Libde, an academic and a Jordanian expert, British Jordanian expert, he said the following. He said, Jordan is like a soft mold. What will happen in Jordan depends on the next leader. If the next leader is a, is a secular, Jordan could become another Dubai or Singapore. Hmm. If the next leader is an Islamist, Jordan could become an Afghanistan. So it, an Arab proverb reads... People worship the gods their kings worship, and that's the case in Jordan. So we need to have the right person in the uh, front carriage of the train, and that's why this conference is about. And uh, I think it will be one of the historical conferences in relevance to the Israeli-Arab conflict, like the Basel conference 120 years ago to the date. Well, it'll be a great honor to carry it. We're going to post it, like I said, on our blogs. We're going to put it up on Facebook and let people understand the truth about what's really going on in the Middle East. You know, we get so many conflicting reports here. People don't know what to believe anymore. But when they see all these leaders coming together to try to work out some kind of solution, maybe then something will click. And actually get done well um, never in history has so many Arabs and so many Jews sat together to discuss this concept that's mm -hmm. why the conference is unique I'm there I'm representing 6.2 million uh, self-identifying Palestinians in Jordan mm -hmm. um, mr. Abid al Mala who is a tribal leader and a political uh, opposition figure representing the Jordanian East Bank of Bedouins. He belongs to the Bani Hassan tribe. Uh, it's dubbed the One Million Man tribe. So we are, and we have also another people, two individuals from Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. So Arabs are represented there and they're there to speak their minds and say the truth. And I think this, the outcomes of this conference will be very interesting. And it's an issue to watch for the American people because it has everything to do with the money going to the to the wrong people like the king and Abbas of the Palestinian Authority. And for the amount of investment, political investment in the West Bank or on the Palestinian-Israeli affairs. Um, with what's happening right now, Israel is emerging as the only stable ally of the West or the the American people in the mm -hmm. Middle East. Now, Israel is not an angel. Israel is just another state. States do good things and bad things. But Israel is a democracy. Israel is an advanced secular democracy that's willing to not let down the American people and the American uh, military, which depends to a great extent on cooperation in the region with the Israeli military which is very advanced very efficient and very strong 
Therefore, Israel's well-being is at, at the heart and center of Americans' interest. And if this conference could bring peace and could at least end the uncalled for Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's quite a huge interest to the American people themselves. Oh, absolutely. It's, an in, it's in the best interest of the whole world, actually, if this conflict could mm -hmm. finally be ended. Well, um, it could because people, okay, why are the Palestinian people still fighting against Israel today? They are fighting because they don't have a home, they don't have a proper passport, they don't have a state of their own, they don't have a country they can call theirs. Um, if Jordan becomes their country, if Jordan offers them what they are entitled to in their homeland, they, we're not calling for the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and kicking them out of Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. Right. No Israeli in his right mind wants that. But we are saying that 2.2 million Palestinians in the West Bank and 2.1 million Palestinians in Gaza, those people, according to the Jordanian Citizenship Act, all of them are Jordanians. Right. They want a health certificate, death certificate, marriage decree, marriage certificate. They can always get it from Amman, Jordan, and not from Jerusalem. That's the entire difference. There's a lot of people, a lot of Canadians in New Hampshire where I grew up. Those people, they have Canadian passports and they get their benefits and welfare and everything else from the Canadian state, but they still live in New Hampshire, and there are a lot of New Hampshireers living in Quebec. They still are citizens of the United States. At the moment, we have our citizens living in Israel, who Jordan, under the king, is telling them, you're not citizens, you should go back to liberate Palestine from the evil Jews. Mm. This is where the problem is. It doesn't mean that terrorism is going to stop tomorrow, but it means that for the first time, we have a demographic, mm -hmm. geographic, political and economic solution all in one and I can't say much about what I really know but let's just settle for this statement I think the powers that be in the establishment in DC London Riyadh Saudi Arabia and Jerusalem the establishment in those countries are becoming more convinced in the solution and I think it if there's ever a chance for it to happen, it is now. So let's not miss the chance. Sure. You know, earlier yeah. you mentioned Anwar Sadat being more of a pragmatist. How does El Sisi fit into that? And what about the Saudi royal family? Because they obviously wield some influence in the region. Where do they stand on not only on this conference, but on the overall plan that you're talking about? Well, the Saudi royal family, they have a new gentleman, uh, a new prince. I call him the Prince of Change, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. This gentleman is so <coughs> secular, so democratic, not has democratic values. I wouldn't call him democratic, but he has established westernized democratic values. For example, he is married only to one woman versus uh, the Saudi customs of marrying at least three or four women. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is very loyal to his wife, family man, goes, uh, drives himself from his office back home, and photos of him sitting with his children. Very, you know, average guy who happens to be to rule with his father, King Salman, a kingdom which they want to reform. He began with some serious reforms. First of all, he's been locking up all terror inciting imams. Uh, there's a lot of terror incited imams in Saudi. He's been locking the most mischievous one. Despite public outcry, he put them all in jail in one day. This is so gutsy, and as they say in Hebrew, takes a lot of chutzpah to do that. Mm -hmm. Second, he's allowed women to drive, and therefore, in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, he, I believe, sees a necessity of it to end. Saudi has paid a lot of money to the Palestinian Authority, almost as much money as the United States has, and it's, been, it's given them nothing but more trouble upon trouble. Also, the Saudis have come to learn the hard way who is Jordan's king and what he stands for. 
selling oil to buying oil from ISIS, selling weapons to ISIS. He was caught red-handed at least twice, uh, and a lot of other things. And also his alliance, his open alliance with Iran which may shock a lot of your viewers, and they can, you know, look up my work and see that the king is actually in an alliance with Iran. Right. So the Saudis would not cry over the king if he leaves. As for a Sisi, a Sisi is playing an incredibly advanced role in protecting Jordan itself. He is, um, he has his troops, and this is very classified, very few people know about this. Egyptian special forces have been fighting with the American forces against ISIS in Syria. Egyptian special forces control and protect the Syrian borders with Jordan and that proves how efficient and how uh, trusted the, the Egyptian army is. And Al-Sisi is openly pro-Israel and sees peace with Israel as a top necessity. Mm -hmm. Most important, al-Sisi is a sworn enemy of the terror group called the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. The terror group Muslim Brotherhood is the very group that produced Mr. Osama bin Laden. Uh, he was a Muslim Brotherhood member at the beginning of his life. So is the current emir or imam of the ISIS. So this is a very vicious terror group. And ironically, the headquarters is three miles away from the king's personal palace in Amman. He's friends with them. He he himself put him, put them in government, put them in the parliament, and put them in city halls, where he installed them to control the country. So CC sees a very major interest in change in Jordan if it brings the demise of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is very important for the American people too, because if the Muslim Brotherhood headquarters, global headquarters, is in Amman. The mm -hmm. only country they'll control, they used to control three countries, Turkey, Jordan, and Egypt. They lost, they've lost; they lost Egypt and Turkey. They no longer have the control they used to have, while in Jordan, they still have full control under the king himself. They've manifested themselves through the government with the king's very own approval. So if this changes and the Muslim Brotherhood is gone, um, this is a huge advantage that not only CC seems to understand it's also uh, the u.s military and intelligence establishment and i'm afraid i cannot say more more about that hmm. well i'll tell you that's that's fascinating because uh both el sisi and egypt and the saudi royal family saudi arabia they wield so much influence in that area if they're on board with this even at this point, in a tacit way, not not going out and publicizing it, uh, that's got to be huge for you, and it's got to be a, a real boost for the conference that you have coming up on the 17th. Well, an evidence, there has been three similar conferences in the last seven years, and uh, the King of Jordan didn't pay a lot of attention to them. This one, because it came at the very particularly uh, interesting time where the king is actually really vulnerable and that people are willing, people of the region, the governments of the region are willing to accept this solution. That's why the king has been viciously attacking the conference. Allow me a minute of explaining what's been happening. Um, uh, there's a, um, and I'm not reluctant to use names at all. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the, a gentleman by the name of Khalid Abu Tweme. He's a Palestinian uh, Palestinian uh, journalist in, uh, in Jerusalem, so-called Arab Israeli, and he often dis, uh, d d displays uh, or exhibits himself as pro-Israel, pro-peace, and he has a clique of, uh, I think, two or three friends of his, and they have been attacking the conference left and right. Mm. This is this was this came after we received an email from one of Khalid's friends, who said that we are putting together a campaign to take you out. And mm -hmm. since he told me that there has been a campaign against the conference, it's been called a fraud. Uh, I've been called by those people. A handful of people, no more than five, a fraud. Uh, they've been, and when it didn't work, they 
up the ante into going after my personal things, like uh, typical the way people were attacking President Trump during the campaign. Uh, it's all boiled down to uh, one of them. I think her name is Bat something Bat Zion, posting you know a series of tweets on uh, social media which would hurt my family personally. Like at one point speaking about my own mother, and while while this is all nasty and messy. Um, this guy, gentleman Khalid Abu Twemi, has a concretely established connection to Jordan's former intelligence chief, whose name is Muhammad Dahabi. Your listeners may not be interested in hearing this, but the guy has concrete, concrete connections to Jordan's intelligence, and he and his friends have been launching a jihad on the conference. Now, how do you know the importance of an event or even a person? You know the importance of an event or a person by the importance of the enemies facing them. And Very to Khalid right. Dweme and others to launch a fake news uh, campaign against the conference. Uh, it shows that we are, we have hit a nerve with the king and uh, we are hurting him uh, with this because we're proposing something that could actually happen. Two, three, four years ago, the last similar conference was in, in uh, September 2013, and the king didn't pay any attention because it wasn't going to happen. Right now, it could happen. You need to stay tuned and keep an eye on Jordan. I was on your show uh, two years ago, and I said things would start happening in Jordan. And one year, 12 months after that show, there were six terror attacks in Jordan, uh, and the year ended with a major terror attack, where Jordan seven terror attack where the a Jordanian soldier executed three American soldiers in cold blood and basically I've been proven right several times about my predictions or analysis for Jordan and now I'm telling you um, fast in your seatbelt you will see one of the most interesting countries in the Middle East in the news in the very foreseen future um, boy Diane don't you Diane, don't you just wish we could go over there and be a part of this? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> wow. I mean, this is this is huge news, Mudar. And what we want to do is have you back on after the conference so you can explain to our listeners what transpired at the conference, uh, how successful the conference was, some of the things uh, that may be happening moving forward because uh, of that conference, would you be able to do that with us? That would be an honor, always an honor, and uh, always a joy to be with you and uh, to have your listeners tuning in. Well, Diane, don't you think we're just, I mean, this we're so lucky to have Mudar as not only as a friend, but uh, as a friend of the show to get the Absolutely. accurate information out to our listeners. Yeah, because, you know, Mudar, the information we get here is so tainted by the media, so lopsided, so anti this, anti that. It's very good to hear the real truth. Well, um, the truth comes in many forms, and it's very rare to witness and grasp. Um, uh, for example, you know, always conspiracy theories kick in. But, you know, when we watch the, uh, the polarization of the American society, when we watch people like Antifa, uh, when we watch people speaking about civil war, when we watch people attacking President Trump left and right for no clear reason, uh, we do, as friends of the American people, feel concerned that there are those who want to push their agenda on the American people's will and whether we like or hate Trump, he won with popular vote, and the votes have been counted and turned him into president. But it mm -hmm. seems that there are some people who are refusing to make those voices count. Well, you're hmm. you're absolutely right, and uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time in this segment. But Mudar, we've got to thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, especially getting over a, a, you know, a, a health situation that you've had in the, in the last week or so. Pneumonia is really, folks, what he had. Um, it, it means a lot to Diana. It means a lot 
to, to myself to have you as a guest on the show as often as possible. The conference is coming up on October 17th. It's in Jerusalem. And we're gonna we're gonna get a, a live feed, Diane and I, for uh, our Facebooks and and for our uh, respective blogs. So we'll be watching. We'll be there with you in spirit. Oh, absolutely. And we'll keep people informed every step of the way about what's actually taking place at the conference. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate this, and I'd love to end with thanking you again and thanking your listeners for listening to me. And uh, always wishing America a, the best. And God bless America and the American people. Thank you, Mudar, so yes. much for being yes, our Mudar. guest tonight and, and for being such a frequent guest on the show. We appreciate it more than you know.